Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I hope that you're all keeping well. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. And thank you to the organizers here at Sam Expert Day, who without this, obviously this talk would not be possible. Today, I'm hoping to share with you two of my passions, which are gaming and Xamarin, and what happened when a project allowed me to combine the two of those together. So we'll get the introduction down of the way quickly. Um, my name is Sean Lawrence. I'm a software engineer, have been for one and a half decades now. Uh, my main background comes from desktop development, primarily WPF, and that slowly migrated through to building mobile applications natively. And then I found a comfortable home within Xamarin and Xamarin Forms. I've been here for a good few years now. My primary work is on functional business applications. So there's never really been the license to unleash the creative side. Um, that is until this project came along. So between myself and a friend, we believe we've now finally been able to bust the myth that side projects always go unfinished. Uh, so through the use of Xamarin Forms, we've been able to build a mobile game based on a, on a on a popular word search game with a slight twist in the fact that you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know the category. The result being you have to guess the category at the end. Through the use of Xamarin Forms and the wider community, we've actually ultimately been able to build this ridiculously quickly. From building a proof of concept back in February, we managed to get it within the app stores within five months. And then on top of that, we, based on calculations, we've recently made 98% of the code in this app is within the shared project. Now, that is no reflection on our abilities as developers. Um, we're certainly not 10 times developers. In fact, that's a myth I do still believe. It, what it does, I believe, is reinforce just how valuable Xamarin, Xamarin Forms, and then the frameworks and the communities that have been built around Xamarin really are. And as Gerald thankfully pointed out, we do, we are live. So there, there's a link here, which the, the slides will be shared later. So you can go and check it out. Please do. Any feedback is welcome. So for the purpose of today, we're going to try and take some of the concepts of that game and then apply it to a demo application. I don't want to open up the, the word search code base and start digging around mainly because it's, it's never fun trying to pick apart what someone else's code does. So for the purpose of today, I've designed a, a mobile game that is based on, inspired by my daughters, based on a memory matching game that they used to play as children. Well, still are children, but they're growing up very, very quickly. We, as I mentioned, I'm quite good at building functional apps, so there is no prettiness to it yet. And then on top of that, we'll see shortly that there was an extra bit of influence come from the community while I was writing this talk and uh, building the app. Uh, an excellent post from Kim from, down from Australia came up about being able to render circular avatar views and pad them together. Now, that, has, that instantly became the inspiration for the score counter that we're going to see shortly in the game. And I think it also then emphasizes the value of where, what the community provides to us. And again, if, you, if you're not familiar with Kim's work, you really should check him out. Not only does he create great content like the avatar view, but there's also a website and a app built with Xamarin that curates Xamarin based content. So any content creators out there, their blogs will typically feature in there. So we will quickly jump and take a look at our mobile application just to see how functional it is, and then we'll have a look at how we're going to improve upon it. So you see we've got a basic app, a little Xamarin shape to render us a circle, and then our speakers today are within tiles. And then if you get a guess right, there's Kim's avatar view. So, that is the application. Now we're going to deal with our first topic of today. So animations, animations in general are going to take up a large part of my talk. Um, it's 
the way that I found that it's really nice to be able to give some visual feedback to users. And the, the first part of that is going to be Lottie. For those of you who are not familiar with Lottie, it's a library that was built and open source by Airbnb and allows us to render After Effects animations within web and mobile applications. Desktop, I believe, too, actually. So through the use of a plugin within Adobe After Effects, it lets us export JSON files, and those JSON files are then rendered natively on the platform. Now, the point about them being impressively small means that if you compare one of these animations to, say, an animated GIF or a PNG or even a video file that we may have used in the past, they are, they are much, much smaller. And again, because they're natively rendered, that means that they can be scaled without loss of quality. And for, again, uh, the less creative types, and this is myself included, there is some fantastic resources out there. There's a site called Lottie Files, which ultimately allows us to, allows animators to provide pre-built animations. They just disappeared now. For use now they are some come free some come paid for and obviously it's good to help these creators out now the purpose of today i've chosen a free one and uh, just we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna take an animation we're gonna apply it to the background and then hopefully make our app feel a bit more dynamic you may notice that the color scheme here doesn't strictly match what i've chosen in the app uh, and now rather than having to change my color scheme this site itself actually provides an inbuilt editor that will let you edit those. I can't do that here because I'm not actually logged in, but because I came prepared, I have already downloaded the files and put them in our platform project. I say I have, there they are. So, for this, for the purpose of this, I am putting them in the platform specific projects. And again, uh, for, for speed, because we do have quite a few topics, I'm actually only going to be working on the, the iOS side, but this, this works equally as well on Android. If we add our JSON files in, then we just need to make sure that they've, they're set to the bundle resource for when we come to use them. And then for Android, it would be an Android asset. Okay, so now that we've got our animations, animation files added, we're now going to go into our main page, which represents this view here. So we've, we've got a grid. And then something that represents our score counter and then the tiles beneath it. You can see that I've actually already gone and added in our JSON file. So we point our animation at the file. Again, as I mentioned, it needs to be a bundle resource. That's the iOS side or an Android asset. We're going to make it uh, repeat infinitely. So it's, it's constantly running in the background. And then we're simply just going to add it to the background of the grid. Now, on top of that, I've also, as you've noticed, may have noticed, I added the trophy JSON file in as well, and I've put that into a, there is a little frame that will show and give us a little bit of positive feedback to say that we've completed the, the game, at least the level. And again, at the moment, so we've got the JSON file, put it as a bundle. This time, because default is it's autoplay, we want to turn that off. And then the only other part that I found while writing this, I frantically realized it didn't work, is that I had to kick this off via code behind. So, like I said, we've named it here. Within the, because our view model obviously uh, implements I, not, I notify property change, that's going to propagate up an event. And then within our XAML code, Things don't behave.
Okay, so now that we're receiving the event from our view model, there we have a state property that will tell us when all of our speakers have been guessed, then we know that the level is, is now complete. So Ahead and look for the is selected property. No, sorry, no. Jumping ahead of myself there. Uh, the state property. Grab our inside our binding context of the current view will be our view model. Uh, I didn't mention, but I have followed the, the MVVM pattern for this. So now what we know is once the state has changed to be complete, then we can kick off our trophy animation. I had gone ahead and added the, the NuGet package for the Lottie purely to try and save on some time, but it is here. So effectively, this is Xamarin based one that I believe there are native ones as well if you're building native Android, uh, native Xamarin applications. It's never fun to play the waiting game. So uh, yes, yeah, so like I said, um, Lottie does provide uh, quite a range of um, functionality. When you first add the package, it will give you the readme file that does give you exposure to every, anything and everything that you can access. The one element that I think is really quite nice, especially if you're, if you're maybe building a game, is the fact that you could manually control the speed. So if you've got a, maybe an intense period in your game, a time element, to put a bit more pressure onto the user, then you can force them to, uh, you, can, you can make them increase the intensity within the game to make them actually feel that pressure. Thanks for the, the mention on the X name. Um, I don't know, Visual Studio for Mac sometimes gets it's, it's a little bit unhappy with me. Um, seems to be okay now. Um, so as you can see now, we've got our little dots floating around that gives us a feel of something feeling a bit more alive. I've also dropped the grid size purely to allow us to view our trophy animation. So now that we've covered, now that we've made our app feel a little bit more alive, we've given the, a, a dynamic background and also a little bit of positive reinforcement when the app, when they, when they complete the level, we're going to move on and then actually make the tiles themselves feel a bit more natural. So the second part of our animation tour is going to be the animation class itself. Now, this, I think, is, is a very well-designed API. It provides a vast amount of power, and yet still somehow manages to, manages to be rather simple. Um, with Xamarin Forms, they do provide a set of pre-built animations. So there are some methods you can animate the scale of a control, the location, the rotation of it. We will be focusing on the rotation, at least for the, our tiles. And then on top of that, then you can actually break down into actually using the animation class and defining 
more complex sequence of events that ultimately allows you to, to manipulate a vast number of part a vast number of properties on a control and what you'll see here is we've I've knocked up a couple of animations here that are rendered using the Xamarin Forms animation class. Now, part of our work has actually involved in consuming a vast amount of value from the Xamarin Community Toolkit. So as a way to try and repay that value, there is some ongoing work to try and provide a more comprehensive set of pre-built animations. The original hope was that it might go in the next major release, which I do believe is 1.3, but that is still to be defined. Uh, the, the work that we're doing, we, we've, we've laid the groundworks, but we just need to make sure that it fits within the, the toolkit itself. The, the, works, the, the set of animations that we would be providing are based off this site here. Um, it's, it's a set of CSS animations that provide up to roughly, I think about 90, 92 animations. So we'd, we'd hope to try and render as many of those as we can within the framework. And if you're ever, if you're feeling like you've, you do want to contribute to open source, then this might be a, an excellent opportunity. Uh, it's quite nice to be able to build something and see something visual and feel that, that feedback. So from that, we're now going to go and actually animate our tiles. For this example, I'm, I've chosen to use a behavior purely because it, it involves right, changing less in terms of the fact that we've got an MVVM approach. We've got the UI here. We want to change the behavior of it when based on some state. So we're going to have a speaker state behavior. And then we're going to plow in and create our behavior. For those of you not familiar with behaviors, it ultimately lets you define a set of behavior, no pun intended, and attach it to a control. So therefore you can invoke that uh, based on any kind of state change. Two key parts to behaviors is attaching to and detaching from. So we can hook things up and make sure that we remove them afterwards. So we not going to run into the risk of any memory leaks. Now, at the point of attaching, the binding context is always null on our UI control. So for that purpose, I'm going to have to listen out for that change and grab access to the binding context once it actually becomes available. As an alternative to doing it this way, I could have maybe added a dependency property or binding property onto the behavior itself and bound to that. I just found having the way that it's defined in the view model, it, it doesn't strictly map that nicely. Having an is guest and an is selected property felt a bit wrong on the behavior. Perhaps if we maybe abstracted that away into a, a state, that may have been a, a nicer way to have designed it. But hindsight is a wonderful thing. We should know that our binding context will be a speaker view model based on the fact that we're attaching to this frame and it's within our collection of speakers and they are of type speaker view model. So we will also keep a copy of that. And ultimately, the changes that we care about are on here. We've got two properties called is selected and is guest. And those are the ones we're going to want to listen out for. Now, as I mentioned, we should behave here. So we will make sure that we unsubscribe from our events. Not run the risk of anything hanging on to this.
I've also, and I'm not sure it's always necessarily the most wise, I've done used the hack to allow you to use some more of the more modern C sharp language features. Seems to work quite nicely up until the point where you start to write platform specific code and then you realize you're back writing an old language. So we want to listen out for our is selected property. So when the value on this is changed, as you can see there, we will then react to that and then we're going to kick off our animation. We're going to do that in two parts so that the point is what we're going to do is we're going to make it look like it's actually like a card flipping over. So we're going to want to rotate it 90 degrees with the, the, the image hidden. And then we'll make the image visible and then finish off the final 90. So then actually give you the effect that it is rotating. That we're going to want to do around the X axis. So we shall rotate 90 and I believe 100 plus 100, 200 is probably about a good time for this type of animation. And then we are going to bounce in. Easings are one of those things that they can make really quite subtle differences, but they really do actually make the difference. So that it's quite, I think it's very important to actually play with these as you're doing it. I originally thought a spring would have worked well here, but actually that failed miserably. Um, now that we've rotated the 90, so we're almost flat, then we're going to want to make our image visible or invisible based on whether we're showing or hiding. So we'll point it at the view models value. And then we shall rotate the final 90. So we'll rotate down to zero. This and then again, we'll use the same easing. Okay. So we've got our behavior. It's attaching, and then we've got our property changed a bit. Next, if we jump back to the XAML now, we need to attach that to our view or frame. So behaviors. Speaker state behavior. And then we want that to be false. So again, yes, uh, as I mentioned, we could have had dependency properties here, or sorry, binding properties. That's me going back to my WPF days and bound some state from the speaker view model into our behavior. Okay, Visual Studio is not happy, but it's compiling, so we'll go for it and pray for the best. There, we can see that we've got our little animation. Okay. I think there is actually a slight issue where this frame should have had a visibility binding to actually hide these tiles. See that they're actually still visible. But that's okay because now we're, we're going to, so um, now that we've, we've provided the rotation, what I'd like to do is then give a little bit of feedback to show that they've, they've, they've had a match and therefore give a, another bit of, I guess, visual feedback. So for that, we have, a, we have an is guest property. So once, we, once they're matched, then we know that we've had a success. So as I previously mentioned that there, 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 are, pre, there are inbuilt animations provided by Xamarin Forms, but for this, we're gonna actually 
go and create a more complex one via the animation class. This might seem a slight odd way to do it, but I'm actually going to write the code that will trigger the animation first, purely on the fact that it should hopefully help to understand some parts of what we're going to write after that. So when we add it, we need to give it an owner. So that will allow us to, well, an owner and a name, which then effectively would allow us to cancel it if we ever needed to. And there, there is a lot of value in that. So it, it's while it's nice to give this visual feedback, we don't want to sorry, block the user from being able to complete the task that they want to do. So if you can cancel out, then that, that, that's a good thing. And then therefore they, they don't feel like they're, they're being held back in any way. Uh, we don't care about rate for now. That effectively defines your frame rate of your animations. Uh, 16 does seem like a fairly sensible option. So I think it's, that will then, I mean, you can make it smoother by adding, reducing that, but ultimately you, you're, you're limited by the platforms that you're running on. So uh, Android is sometimes less forgiving in that regard. So as I say, 16 is a, is a pretty sensible default. And as you increase it, then you end up getting to potentially blocky animations. Uh, and again, so we're, we're going to play with the easings. And this time, I do believe a spring works. But um, as I say, it, it's, it's very important to try and experiment with these because you, like I say, they're, they're quite subtle differences, but you should, you can see how they do make uh, things feel more natural or actually less natural based on really quite subtle changes. And finally, we are going to, once it gives us a callback to say, well, now the animation has finished. And for that, we're simply going to make our frame invisible and therefore make sure it doesn't exist on, on the screen. So we've defined something and then we've, we've started it. Now we actually need to define the frames within this animation. And this is where the, the real kind of value comes. So um, when you're adding an animation, an animation is effectively is, is a collection of other animations. An animation itself represents the action that take, is taken. I don't know how deep you can nest them. I can't honestly say I've ever tried going further than just this level, but it might be interesting to see. Um, so what we do is we add the starting point of our frame and the ending point. So it's going to start at 0% and go through to 20% of this length. And then on top of that, so we, we define the time duration and then we define the action that is taken. For our animation, what we're going to do is we're going to scale. We're going to change the, the size of the, the control. So we have to define the behavior of what happens and then the value for you to change from and to. So we're going to start at 100% of the size of the, the, the tile, and then we're going, to, we're going to drop it by 10%. I know it's not necessary to maybe add all of these zeros, but I think you might start to notice that it becomes a bit more easier to read when you have lots lined up together. So we're going to slightly drop it, then increase it again, and then we're going to drop right down to zero, just to give it a little kind of a bouncy collapse. And that's it. So like I say, we, we've, we've created an animation. We've added our frames. The actions are going to get taken at different time sequences, and then we commit it, and that will then trigger those off for us. We've already added this. And there was that issue, but that's been sorted and the frames there. So I believe this should let us view the animation. I can leave on that. So we do see the animation, but actually there's a little bit of behavior that should have changed. So um, 
at the moment the logic of actually tapping on a tile will then it'll leave it open for half a second and then it will apply the, the state change now sadly well probably are much better ways of doing it rather than a task.delay but for the purpose of a quick demo this will show us so what i'm going to do is i'm going to move the the setting of the guest state to be before the delay and therefore the animation will trigger while we're waiting therefore it shouldn't rotate back before we then see the collapse And there you go, a bit of feedback to show us that it's done, which I think looks good, but I think we can make this much, much better. And that is where we're going to take us, it's going to take us to our final topic of today. And that is rendering a particle effect in a Xamarin Forms application. Um, it wasn't something I necessarily expected to be possible, but surprised that it was actually remarkably simple. As you can see here, um, this is what we've rendered within our uh, super word search app it really gives a, a nice finishing touch on actually achieving something for this we're going to make use of Xamarin forms effects um, for anyone who's not aware of those that ultimately allows you to, to it's a similar in a way of a behavior but it lets you define that define something uh, define something that you can customize on an existing native control so therefore we're going to have our frame or tiles and we're going to add it and then implement it on the platform specific code so therefore we are this is where we're going to start to write some ios code i can't take any credit for the concept it's um another community blog post reinforces the value that is out there um by actually another speaker today rendy and i, I recommend you go and check out his his content as well and ultimately he proved that you could render it within uh, Xamarin, uh, Android and iOS. And we are now going to jump over and add our final bit of code. Now, sadly, I, I know that I'm talking quite quickly. I've had to actually pre-write this code, mainly based on the fact that I'm trying, I think I might be trying to fit more content in than I possibly should have, but hopefully at the end of it you will see the value in what this provides so we've created an effect that is based off the xamarin routing xamarin forms routing effect which allows us to then attach it to our controls we've got a few properties so how many particles we want to spawn how long they're going to live for how quickly they're going to move the size of which they're going to spawn and at the end of the day the image that will be rendered then we've got an extra bit of behavior to be able to fire an event that we can then subscribe to in the platform specific code and then actually react to. And again, as I said, to, to save on a little bit of time, I have pre-written this, but we'll, we'll have a quick overview and then we can actually start to see it in action. So in a similar way to behaviors, we have, we can attach and de well, we're given events to be able to handle the attachment and the detachment to these controls and therefore then we can start to grab bits that we care about and obviously behave well and tidy up after ourselves that will then lead me on to the actual the core logic of of this platform specific effect so what we're going to do is we're going to actually start to deal with the core animation layer that is provided by apple and obviously Microsoft to provide wrappers around all of their APIs. So we need to build uh, the emitter that is actually going to spawn and fire off our uh, particles that will then start to move around. And then that needs to know about the particles themselves. This, the, the particles are referred to as cells. Um, And what we need to do is we need to give them a way to refer to them. And I'll get onto that a little bit later. And then we're, we're transferring the values from our effect in the, the shared code base into the actual platform specific. 
So we're dealing with, again, the, the spawn spawn rate. You'll notice this might look a little strange. This just allows us to have slightly random sized. It actually allows the, the emitter to, to, to generate that. Uh, we are multiplying here. So because the different platforms behave differently, we you have to end up settling for a, a sensible set of units and then translating across to your platform specific code base. And then finally, we're going to emit in a fold 360 degrees, if my maths is correct. And we, so like I said, we, we tell it the image to spawn, tell the the emitter what cells to spawn. So you could actually have multiple cells. You could have different images, different size, different speeds. And then we're going to stick it on the, the control itself. And that, in effect, the act of adding it will actually start firing. And given that we only want a short-lived particle effect, we're going to kick off a task to then delay for a short period of time and then actually tell it to set its birth rate down to zero. That's the way to, to tell it to stop emitting. And you'll notice that we've got, that's how we identify it. And then we've got a few keywords that are Apple-specific parts. We haven't set up this so we can do that and then we should drop our images in there's another helpful bit of input from kim here whereas i'd gone full white and actually dropping the opacity really does make a, a nice big difference so actually it, even just writing this i've actually started to appreciate some level of collaboration between the community which really does feel um like it helps. So we've done that. Now we need to go over to the XAML and we need to attach it. Now you may notice that I'm adding it a level above the frame. I'm not doing it on the, the frame itself like we did with the behavior. And that's purely because we're we're changing the visibility of the frame. So therefore we don't want it to risk changing the visibility of the particle effect while it's mid um, in the process of emitting the, the, the particles because then it just gives us a really rather unpleasant experience to the user. Just going to set a few of these settings. So uh, ultimately, these, this was a lot of trial and error just to find out what actually felt comfortable. This is what I've settled upon. So like I said, we've added our particle effect. We've told it we're going to spawn 40. Uh, the image, how long are they going to live for? How quickly they're going to move? So the final piece of this puzzle is we've not, no one, nothing has actually fired the event so what we're going to do is if we jump over into our behavior class this we already know that we've had a success and actually better than that we know when our animation has finished so as a, a final point once it's collapsed and we're, we're going to emit the stars and actually get to see yet more confirmation of actually achieving something so again, we're, we're jumping up to the parent because in the XAML, we've added it to the grid, which is the parent of the frame. So we need that and then we need a bit of link. And I'm avoiding the safety first approach and just going straight, assuming that it exists, obviously. Might be better practice to um, do a first or default. Make sure that it does actually exist, and not just try and fire it. Run into exceptions there. I'm hopeful that we will now actually get to get a final bit of feedback to the user to make it feel like they've got a whole and complete. Success. And 
And there we go. Now, I should really put a bit of a timing in here so I actually get to see that effect before this. But there you go. You've got that fancy little effect there. And I think that, that really does start to give us a nice rounding off. Okay. So that's it for the code that we've, we were going to write today. Um, just realized I really don't have much time left. So um, I wanted to give a quick shout out to, I guess, all of the hidden gems that allowed us to at least build the app. Uh, there's lots of parts that may be functional, um, that you don't necessarily see and they really do um they really have provided value i mean we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we have without them from loading svgs obviously that avoids scalability issues the xamarin community toolkit has been ridiculously helpful much more so than i actually envisage by adding it through to things like mobile build tools that uh manages your image assets much more simply so you don't have to worry about creating all the platform specific ones in each project uh, if we had more time i'd then start to maybe look at expanding the senses that we're appealing to so we could add some haptic feedback so when you tap the tile you get it or maybe like a double haptic when you get a success and audio audio is actually provided a really um big a really a lot, a lot of positive feedback in, in our app which um, surprisingly, it was quite strange given that while we were doing it, we were running with a lot of sample audio. So it always um, someone reading out audio jungle over the top and it then became really quite confusing to hear the actual audio without that. But I do thoroughly recommend doing that. Um, fonts would be another topic, um, but do be very wary that while it seems very easy to download fonts, uh, the vast majority of them are not actually free for commercial use. So you really wanted to check there before you actually go in and, and do it, but they do they can make a big difference. So in summary, thank you again for attending today. I really hope you've enjoyed the content as much as I did creating it. I hope it's shown you how you can make a game and actually really an app feel much more natural through the use of positive feedback. Um, there are a wide range of possibilities that you could achieve with it and i'd actually really like to hear if anyone does um with an accessibility caveat i would strongly suggest that you adhere to settings on the phone so actually if motion's turned off probably should not be doing any form of animations and then uh my slides are here though sorry my slides will be there at the yeah, in a short while my code is up and it has been for a while so please take check it out leave comments thank you very much that's All right. right, thank you so okay. much, Sean. Um, I see a couple of um, comments in the chat. Thank you, thank you. Great session. I already put your little GitHub repository in there so that people can check out the code for themselves. Of course, the session will be available on this channel afterwards as well, and all the stuff um, Sean's going to put on the um, repository that we got for the exam expert day as a whole. So that was amazing. Um, I think I actually learned a thing or two. The Graphic stuff is not really my forte usually, so um, that is great. Thank you.